Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Joining me in center ring today, we have Dr. Anne, and Dr. Anne is coming to us from Spain. So I love these interviews when I get to talk to people in different countries. It's just it's one of the wonderful aspects of technology, and and I'm so happy to have met you, Dr. Anne. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for inviting me, Judith. Okay, so the listeners are going to really, really have an advantage with this episode. So Dr. Anne is a psychologist, and she has this program that she uses in, in the divorce arena, and it's called My Freedom to Thrive. So she's not a divorce coach per se, but I'm sure coaching elements come in. She is a psychologist. And so I want to make that very clear. Dr. Ann, what is, what is my three to, freedom to thrive? Okay. So I work specifically with clients who come to me um, in high conflict divorce. So originally when I started working, I was working in the abuse arena with women who had had maybe adverse childhood events. And as I tracked my client group, I discovered that what was happening was they were getting involved in maybe unhealthy relationships. That was then going into marriage, and then they were coming out the other side in in the divorce arena. Now, unfortunately, because of their... um, lack of skill set in picking healthy partnerships and healthy relationships. They were kind of becoming involved with um, men in their marriages who predominated their relationship with control and coercion in the relationship. So when they then got into the divorce arena, what was happening is the same sorts of behaviors they were experiencing during their relationship were now tracking them into divorce. How do you mean? How do you mean? Example. So when we think about divorce, you know, we understand that people are emotionally raw. There may be a bit, you know, they're upset. The relationships come to an end. They're very confused and there's lots of change going on. Um, But we have an expectation that what's going to happen is we're going to do the best for the kids. We're going to try and make get an arrangement so the children are, you know, settled and happy. And that we're going to get an arrangement as as quickly as possible so we can go our separate ways, lick our wounds and and get on with our life. Well, what was happening with my particular client group was actually the types of men that they were involved with weren't doing that. What was actually happening was the control and coercion that they'd seen in the marriage was now happening in, in divorce. So instead of negotiations being easy and straightforward, there was a lot of delay. There was a lot of game play. There was a lot of increasing litigation. There was a lot of involving more and more court cases, more and more court visits, um, agreements being brokered, but then being broken or simply ignored. So the clients I was was starting to get sent were, were probably about two years in this process um, and had really been struggling to make agreements with their partners, their ex-partners. So they were kind of caught in a loop, um, highly anxious, very distressed, and quite frankly, very, very confused and isolated. So what I recognized was this was a different client group. This wasn't, you know, your typical divorce. This wasn't somebody who can be coached to go through here are the stages of us recovering and building up our life because there was a different psychological dynamic at play both prior to the divorce and now being played out in the divorce and it impacted on everyone around them so not just the individual who was trying to get the divorce but all the legal professionals the social service professionals everyone who would be around this core group of this individual who essentially is incredibly difficult and, you know, those difficult difficulties are spreading out to everyone that they touch. Okay. Um, so go on then with my freedom to thrive. So now that you saw so, that this was what you were dealing with predominantly, then how does this work? Yeah. So what I realized was that the women that I started to get were all very reasonable, nice ladies, 
um, you know, often talking about reasonableness and trying to negotiate. This wasn't people who were coming in spitting and furious and, you know, crazy and unstable. Um, they were generally just, you know, I want to get this organized, or a, a, a fair settlement so I can move on with my life. But they'd been trying for two years and this wasn't happening. So what I realized was the problem was that they didn't really understand the psychological dynamics of their of their both their previous relationship or the or the partner that they were now trying to detach from. Um, they had been to a certain extent living with uh, a different levels of abuse, some of them to the point of real physical abuse many of them financial abuse so that their partner had had control of the money, very much control of their social life, where they could go, when they could go, who they could see. Now, this wasn't at the point that it was so blatant that they were aware that they were even in these types of controlling relationships. Um, So part of Freedom to Thrive was really about firstly educating them as to what the dynamic was that was in the relationship because it was now just being played out in the divorce. It wasn't a change. This wasn't, many of them are told this is a result of the divorce. It wasn't a result of a divorce. This was a continuation of what was prior to divorce. This was their relationship just now being played out in a new playground. So part of the problem was because their partners were often incredibly plausible, often very charming, um, you know, there wasn't, you know, maybe umpteen police reports for physical or violence. There wasn't anything that they could tangibly say that this was an abusive relationship. Often these women had no idea that what they were experiencing was literally coming from, from their partner. So a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the narrative that we would read in divorce is very much about consensus, is about mediation, is about us all sitting down and, and reaching an agreement. Now, these my clients would, were completely motivated to make agreement. They wanted to make agreement, but were just unable to do so. So when they come to me, they really are in a stage where they don't quite know what's going on. They don't quite know why the, you know, the divorce isn't progressing. Normally we're talking six to 12 months. Most of mine are coming to me at two years time and still none the further forward. Um, Some of them have been unable to get their partners to leave the house. Some of them have had, you know, money be not, you know, have been taken from bank accounts. They're continually debating over, you know, maintenance money for their children. And unfortunately, the narrative around them was very much, you know, well, it takes two to tango in any conflict. So it must be something to do with you. If you learn the proper skills to negotiate with your partner, then, you know, that they will become, you will reach agreement. In these cases, that's not the case. What you've got is someone who's very, very difficult, who actually quite enjoys it. And quite enjoys evading, enjoys lying, enjoys stalling. So it's a different set of parameters um, involved in negotiating with these individuals. And that's where my Freedom for Thrive came from, because the first step is these women basically beginning to understand, firstly, what they've been dealing with throughout their whole relationship prior to the divorce, what that now is going to mean in terms of their divorce. And then what it's going to mean in terms of them going forward and how do they actually truly break free from what are, in in, in essence, incredibly um, controlling relationships. Because unfortunately, in these types of relationships, once you have become married to one of these types of individuals, then you are forever their property. So they are always going to attempt to bring you back into court or back into some sort of conflictual um, arena, whether it be money or children. But there'll be, all, you know, there will always be some attempt by them to be able to bring you back. And really, the ladies, it's about them learning how to be completely independent. Okay, so if I may, just for a second, yeah. even after the divorce is final, there are still those attempts to bring back to court because. That's just the way it is for the high conflict personality. 
Absolutely. So especially if you have children involved, um, yeah. you know, I have one client who is 10 years on this roundabout um, and, you know, the divorce happened what, eight years ago, maybe, but now it's a continual, whenever he kind of gets a bit bored, it's back to family court, let's, you know, let's create a bit of turmoil. So it's learning a lot of the, or, you know, you think about if you have children going to university, going, you know, weddings, first grandchild, um, holidays, there's always those contacts. If the ladies can get a clean break, financially and even if it you know and this is terrible to say but even if it means that they can take a lesser settlement but they get away then often that can be you know that is it sometimes I think of it is that is the price of freedom yes and you know what I have to agree with you only because I'm not a psychologist but I'm a mediator and so I work with people over settlement agreements and quite often it's just where is your compromise point? And that's what I say to everybody. There's the law and then there's what works for you. And Mm. it's, unless you're going to trial, it's a Mm. compromise. So what do you need to get out? You know, Mm. what's the price you need to pay to get out? It's life. Unfortunately, it's just so I'm glad that you, you think yeah. like that. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's why I, I recommend the um, ladies, or, you know, go to um, a financial advisor. So what they can learn is what's the, what's their bottom line that they're going to be able to get. If they hit that magic number, they can, they can agree it and run. Now they don't necessarily have to tell their ex partner what their bottom line is. They're negotiating for hire, but they know that if they make that magic number, they're going to be able to live. They're going to be able to, to financially function and get back on their feet and be able to, you know, have, have a, a degree of, of comfort whilst they build up their career or whatever they need to do in order to, you know, continue uh, financially for the rest of their life. But they need to know what their bottom line number is, because once they know that, it's almost like a, a, a foundation from which they, you know, they can, they can negotiate from. Absolutely. Um, if, you know, there's, there's a variety of high conflict personalities and one mm. is sociopath. Mm. If you're dealing with a sociopath, uh, it's my understanding that a sociopath does not obey rules. There are no boundaries. And just because something's written on paper, that doesn't mean they will do it. Do you find with some of these high conflict personalities that even though the deal is struck, that person may not fulfill their their end of the bargain? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's you know it's it's often very common. I get clients who have told me that they've sat in mediation and the, their ex partners charmed the mediator. They've struck the deal. They you know everybody looks very happy, and then they've literally walked outside and they've been told, "If you think I'm sticking to that, you know, you're you're delusional." So they they're very good at performing in public. To give the idea or the or the or the sense that they're they're agreeing and they're negotiating and then you know but with, with little to no intention because the rules don't apply to them quite frankly for right. these particular individuals they're not they are not um, they're not beholden by any higher power so you know most of us know that we have to obey the law most of us know that there's social rules and they and a conscience we're talking yeah. about a lack of conscience are we not with those who have some issues <laughs> It, 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 I mean, I think it's it's deeper than that. Oh, so, so, if, so if you're talking about somebody who's narcissistic, they're incredibly grandiose. So when you're grandiose, you believe you're fairer when everyone else is a slave. So it, it, it literally is how they perceive the world. They have very limited empathy, so they don't really understand what their impact is, you know, on anybody else. And it's very much about their own needs. Now, if you're adding things in like sociopathy, when you're adding in things like Machiavellian tendencies, then you're also beginning to think about people that aren't maybe just completely self-centered, but they're also manipulative. So now they're, they're, pre, they're kind of pre, um, pre-planning how they're going to screw you over, quite frankly. So they're looking, okay, if I do this, then maybe 
I'll get this down the road. And and most of us just don't think in those ways. We, you know, sometimes when my clients tell me things, they say to me, you're never going to believe this. And I always say, I'm going to believe it. I'm still going to be shocked, but I'm going to believe it because they are astounding in the way they lie without blinking. They will cheat. They will, they perform as this most, you know, wonderful, plausible, kind individual. They learn the scripts word perfectly. And then they don't do any of them. It's just complete superficial performance. Okay, so I'm going to add something there because I understand exactly what you're saying. When you go into a mediation, since I'm a mediator, the mediator Mm -hmm. doesn't make decisions for you. The mediator Mm -hmm. just engages you both in a conversation different Mm -hmm. than the type of conversation you would have in your own home. Yeah. Um, So there's no such thing as charming the mediator. The mediator Mm. is there just to write the notes and Mm. document the agreement as each person is making those decisions. Mm. So please don't look at the mediator as being the person Mm. who believed. If we were judges, yes, Mm. but we're not. So here's my further point for mediation, and I say this to every single person I interview, and it's important to me, and rarely does anybody agree with me, but I'm still going to say it one more time, and that is mediation isn't for everybody. It just Mm -hmm. isn't. Mediation is for people who are both of the same intention, that they want to work things out and commit to whatever is worked out. Mm -hmm. Mediation is not for people like you just described, sociopathic, narcissistic, who are not going to take the terms written on a piece of paper, even though the the court and the judge have date stamped it, they couldn't care less. Authority means nothing to them. This is not the right person to mediate with. So I'm going to say straight away, you go to court, you let a judge make a decision because you're going to waste your time and money in mediation because they're going to do exactly what you said. Nothing. And I no, I mean I, I completely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. And I think for these particular types of relationships, mediation is, is contraindicated. And it's really nice to understand, you know, what, what your perspective is of mediation because I think that makes a lot of sense for me when I think about my clients going into these particular forums because they're so underskilled in actually dealing with their partner, because they've been with these partners for a long time. So they they are what they're to a certain extent in a mini cult. So they've been brainwashed. They're very submissive. They, they've kind of learned over time that no matter what um, they say or want, they're not really going to get what they want. So going into the mediation, you know, the mediation um, situation, they're already clouded in their judgment. So they don't know that maybe the mediator is completely neutral in that situation because they're so used to being dominated that they just assume that, you know, they're going to believe my ex because everybody else believes my ex. So, of course, this is going to be how it goes. I I tend to say that some of my clients um, go to mediation as part of a learning process. So I have one client at the moment who I've been working with, and she's going into mediation purely to try to to get some evidence of what I'm telling her is true. Because at the beginning, when I'm trying to educate them, they're still not 100% sure that it's not just, you know, a result of, I don't know, some fiction that I'm telling them or, you know, I don't really know and it couldn't really be as bad as all that and maybe it is really me. And So they have to get evidence as they go along through the process to start to understand, oh, wait a minute, this is what I've been living with. Oh, wait a minute he really is that bad. Oh, wait a minute. This is a nightmare. So she's going in one, this particular client is going to mediation in order to do some reality testing. You know, I'm saying, well, this is the likely things that are going to happen. That's a good idea. I like that. Yeah. No, I really do like that because when you see that the behavior at home is played out into a different arena Hmm. or even what you're Uh, challenged spouses saying in mediation, you know the signals, you know when to believe Mm. and when not to believe. And so I think that's a great idea, Doctor. And, you know, I mean, and and as well for her, she, every, every client I've ever had, 
does has never come to me wanting desperately really to get divorced or see the worst in their partner. They always hope that their partner is going to surprise them by doing the right thing. Always. No matter how heinous some of the things they're doing are, no matter how concrete the evidence of the heinousness of what they're doing, they still have this hope that, you know, somehow they're going to do the right thing. So she's going into mediation with the idea that, you know, she wants to give him another chance just okay. to do the right thing. You know, sometimes you have to do that just to check that box and say, okay, clear conscience, let's move forward a different way. Understood. Yeah. Okay. So mediation can be, yeah, mediation can be quite important. It's important for different reasons. And, you know, I definitely, I'm with you. If, if the people go in, if the two parties go in with the, the right attitude, the right desire, fantastic. Get it done. Get it dusted. Move on with your life. You know, go hit, go lick your wounds, heal, whatever you need to do. Um, do it that way because the litigative part, the court part is, is, incredibly difficult it is it you know it's very costly in time in money in energy um and the women i that i work with they're only involved in the court situation because they have no other choice they can't get off the roundabout right okay keep going on what is freedom to thrive what is that process and uh, so i do no freedom to thrive um what Mm. Uh, because I've been working with clients over the whole pro, the whole trajectory of you know the uh, if you want the abuse trajectory, I realised that there is a bit at the beginning of the divorce process, you know, where the women don't know what's happening. So I developed a program that's um, for five sessions. It's over six weeks, and it literally is a deprogramming. Um, program so I first of all I have to calm them down there by the time I get them because bear in mind most of them are like two years into this and and are, are honestly on their knees emotionally they don't know what's happening so I do hypnotherapeutic relaxation work to first of all just get their mind to quieten down so they're not in their emotional reactive fight flight freeze because they can't see straight once we've done that bit, then it's about the education and it's about letting them see the tactics, the, the behaviors, the maneuvers that their partner's been having during the relationship. So it, it is very much, I give them videos, I give them reading literature, we go through um, questionnaires about how the relationship developed because there's generally a pretty predictable pattern. So there's a lot of stuff to start to them to begin to understand the relationship from the beginning. That being so that they can see how the marriage and the divorce is, that the divorce is just a product of all of that's what's gone before. The aim of that is that once their education levels up and their karma, then we can start to talk about how do they survive this process? Because if they're in this process of a high conflict divorce, it's generally going to be a long time. It's not going to be over in a handful of months. It could be talking years. Now, some of the advice I've read has basically, you know, said put all your, co your energy into the divorce. With a high conflict divorce, you cannot afford to do that. If you're waiting for the divorce and the court to make decisions about your money or your life, being at a point where it can rebegin, you are going to go down, quite frankly, because they're going to play. They're going to play. You're going to say, we'll agree this money, and then the money doesn't come, and then the house is going to get sold, but then they've changed their mind. So if the women are waiting for the magic day when the money arrives, in the meantime, their life has, you know, they're destitute, quite frankly. So it's very much about teaching them how do we strengthen your ego? How do we strengthen your skill set? What, you know, I, I will downstream refer to other professionals who I think, okay, this one can help you with maybe business development. This one can help you with just divorce coaching generally so that they can go on to other people that can help them in a longer time. I offer longer term as well, but the, the rapid in, um, in intervention program is really for the crisis management 
is to get them to wake up to smell the coffee as quick as possible because once they've got that grounding then they can start to build then they can start to plan then they can start to say okay I know this horrendous thing is happening to me and this this divorce is here but I can put it in a box as much as possible and I can still get on with my life if they wait to the divorce is signed off they they're going to collapse they they, it's just not going to work because their their partners could have this going for five six x years okay so here's what i love about what you just said and that is you work in this third step to contain the divorce in its own Mm -hmm. box which means you probably work with time management Mm -hmm. you you have to walk away from talking about the divorce, absolutely, um, to allow yourself to breathe, to mm. have a balance in your life, and to live yeah. separately from this drama called the divorce. Mm. And I think that's brilliant, Dr. Ann, because I, I do understand that when we have any type of tragedy, emotional experience, that's also mm. financial, yeah. double whammy, um, that takes over our life, we can be consumed by it and then swallowed up and end up just a completely different version of ourselves. Mm. So I love that, that you do work on separating uh, your new life going forward Mm. and how to thrive Mm. and how do we uh, put some uh, boundaries around the time we invest in the divorce. Keep going. It was great. Well, it, what happens, you see, is when the divorce is happening, um, you know, you, you, the, the clients are getting emails that say, I've, you know, you've got a meeting or you've got a call. Or, and every time they get one, they go into fight, flight, freeze. They, you know, it's immediate. They, they're reactive. Now, if you imagine that happening over a period of years. Oh, my God. I can't. So it's horrible. They've, yeah. So they've come out of a, a marriage where that was happening. And now they're in the divorce and it's still happening. So it's about, okay, what is freedom to thrive? It's about cutting that cord emotionally, mentally. That, okay, this really, you know, difficult individual is still in my horizon, but they're not in my face. And that's how you have, you know, that's about the separation. Okay, this is going to be going on in the sidetrack, but you're not going to be living it. You cannot afford to freeze and be almost like in pause between each and every court event, each and every email from the lawyer. You still have to build, you still have to plan, you still have to grow, you still have to move. Because if you wait for this to be done, you could be waiting a decade and it's still not done. Well, Dr. Ann, okay, so this sounds great, but what if they're still living in the same house? Because you had said that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, it's incredibly difficult. So again, that's about talking to your lawyer and finding out, you know, how do you get that person out? And again, the financial advisor, how do you split the assets? Um because it's, there's, there's certain things, you know, I obviously I can't advise them on. But part of the problem is, is the clients themselves are often so overwhelmed at that point. They don't even know the questions to ask their lawyers. That's right. No, you're exactly right. Now, a question about that. And it's, see, divorce laws are different in different countries and mm. in different states in the United mm. States. Um, could an option be, of course, that... Um, the victim, so to speak, mm. the, 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 the not compromised personality, mm. they can move out of the house if, in fact, they're not giving up their community property rights on the asset called the house, mm. if they can afford to move out, and if they're not going to compromise their rights, correct? I mean, I, I've got a few clients, and I, I kind of try and heads up all my clients to understand that the life they had before is gone, that they're going to have change. Now, if it comes to the, to the, you know, the toss up between being free and in an environment where you can breathe or staying in your marital home, clinging onto it with teeth and nails, choose the freedom because, you know, you can, 
you know, you firstly, you might not be able to afford the house that you had before. So you're going to be living on the breadline just to be able to pay for a house that ultimately is just bricks and mortar. And the stress that comes with that is horrendous. Sometimes it's about knowing that once you get your own place, your own environment, it's not tainted with the relationship that you had before. That's right. Um, and if you could speak to this, I love that you brought this up. Um, what people say, especially if they have small children, what people say is, but this is the only house the kids knew. We have all the memories here. Hmm. Well, memories are inside of you and can be transferred. But how do you address that when people, because that's a common thing that um, moms say. Well, I mean, again, it, it, I think sometimes the problem is that clients are trying to it's not so much about the children in those cases. It's about them remaining the same but different. Mm. They want it to be the same, but they want it to be different. And it's you have to decide where is the difference gonna, line going to be. Now, children are incredibly robust. If they see that mummy is now in a new home, but mummy is so much happier, and I've got my new bedroom, and my new bedroom, I got to choose the paint, and I got to choose what my new duvet cover was, and all my toys are here, um, and mummy isn't crying all the time anymore. Um, you know, the bricks and mortar part of it is is more an adult um, romanticism than it is necessarily a childhood reality. So children in those cases, I think we often, you know, the, the, unfortunately the women are off, that I deal with especially, um, they're really good mums. You know, they, they really are good mums and they, they feel so much guilt that the relationship and marriage is broken down and that the children are going to go through this so they try to re maintain everything they possibly can, the same for the children. And sometimes it's just about saying, okay, if it means mummy's got to work two jobs to pay the rent or the mortgage on the big house and dad, you know, is playing, sometimes he pays, sometimes he doesn't, it's better mummy works one job in a house that she can afford. Absolutely. And and by the way, Dr. Ann, I want to meet the child who uh, chooses their own duvet cover. I'm sorry yes. when you said that. I said, I can't wait to speak. That, I want to meet that kid. <laughs> I would have a lot in common. <laughs> oh, but it is, I mean, I think it is, it, it's like the unfortunate thing. When, when people are going through this particular situation, they... It's not easy realizing your old life is gone. That's the thing. But then the women that I work with, they also have to understand that the life that they're getting rid of was not very nice. It was a bad place. That's why they're getting divorced. Well said. Well said. And so important. I, that, that is, I, I can't tell you what an important part that point this is. And I interviewed somebody, um, Julie Turner, a woman named Julie Turner, some months ago, she's a life coach, and she made this point um, that you just made, and she said, you are going to change emotionally. You are not going to be the same person out of this marriage that you were in this marriage. Don't try and hang on to it. It's natural to change. So she was talking from a life coach point of view, but you're now coming from a psychologist point of view that it, it, you can't stop change. If you want to be a healthy yeah. human being and get through the divorce and start a new life, mm. change is part of it. And that's a beautiful thing, right? Well, I think the thing is, is you know, I see it with my clients. They come to me and, and quite frankly, they're, they're messed up. You know, they, they've been particularly on unhappy relationships where they've been, you know, pretty much treated often like slave servants in the house, you know, to have to do everything and have no real rights of their own. So once they start to recognize the dynamic that they've been living with and why the divorce is going so badly, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's lovely to watch because you start to see the veils lift and then they start to evaluate what's important and what's not important. You know, if my, if why I'm doing this is I want to, I want my freedom to thrive. I want to be, I want to get 
away from this, I want this chance to breathe and grow, then really does something like staying in the same house, is it that important? So you start to see their rationale and their logic kick in. I have never heard in my 10 years of mediating divorces, and I do hear from people after the fact, Sometimes they come for repeat business, but (laughs) I have never heard somebody say, worst decision I made was to give up the house. I have never once heard that. (laughs) Here's what I've heard. Oh my gosh, I'm free. I'm in my own (laughs) place. I I decorated it exactly as I wanted. Mm -hmm. Size doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Happiness does not equate with size. Mm -hmm. Freedom freedom of choice, freedom of self-expression, that's the deal, right? That equates into happiness. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it, it, it's what, it is a, it's a, a gradual growing into that realization. Most of my clients are, you know, running from what their marriage was. And when they finally pulled the cord and said enough is enough, they get this moment of fantastic liberation and they feel like, yeah, I'm finally free. And then what happens is the game just changes to a different context. Mm. So now it's being played out in the divorce and in the court. So part of it is about letting them understand that actually, no, you are free. You're free from the moment you said it was over. You're free. And now it's about how do you um, demonstrate that freedom? How do you start to learn to make those decisions for yourself? Now, independence is scary, you know. It's not, it's not for the faint-hearted, but you get better at it and your muscles grow. Um, and the more you start to be able to see, oh, wait a minute, I can make all these decisions for myself, then it, it becomes kind of addictive and you think, well, actually, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Then you're unmanageable. Now you're free with everybody. It's like, wait a minute. Do I know you? You used to say okay to everything I wanted to do and you're not. That is very funny. So, Dr. Ann, could you do points four and five? We went through the first three points. What are four and five? Okay, so the, it's only, I only really have the three learning outcomes, and those, those are those. It's over five sessions, and the reason I do it over five sessions okay. is because I need to make sure that the information's gone in. Got now, it. as well, what we have is you know, each individual client has – Uh, whatever's going on in their life at that time, whatever part they're in of their divorce. Um, So it may be that they're dealing with the mediation. It may be that they're dealing with family court issues. It may be that they are, you know, going to some point of, you know, the the hearing in the court process. It may be that they are suddenly realising that the lawyer they have doesn't really understand what they're talking about, you know, because it's, it's not, you know, it's not every, it, this isn't every divorce. You know, this is not every divorce, but it's a significant number, but it's not every divorce. So a lawyer or a solicitor in the UK may have seen a couple of these in their lifetime, but they haven't seen them on a regularity. So sometimes what the clients find is they're trying to explain to their legal representation what's going on. And the person's just sort of saying, well, that's just bad marriage. You know, that's just, that's just what happens in a couple. And they're like, it, it can't be, surely this isn't the same. So sometimes it's about, you know, having to help them find um, legal representation who actually are on the same page as them. It really depends on each of their individual needs. Sometimes it's about going back into their childhood so that they start to recognize, oh, why did I get involved in with this relationship in the first place? Yeah. Please, can I not do this again? Yeah. Um, what do I need? So I, on my on my website, I you know I do different blog posts, and some of it is about things like red flags, so that they understand here because the women that I work with, the one thing I would say is they don't trust their gut. They don't know at the beginning when they meet a man who is making them feel uncomfortable that they don't have to pursue that relationship or they don't need 
they allow that individual to pursue them. Now, that's where it starts. So when you they then fast forward, say 15, 16, 17 years later, and the same thing's happening in the court, it's really important that they understand where did it start. And it started right at the beginning. So it's for them then to go, because a lot of them want to go and have other intimate relations, but they're absolutely terrified because they're like, well, I'm like, what if I choose somebody like this again? Yeah, I thought right. he was Prince Charming. It was all, you know, it was right. wonderful at the beginning and what's gone wrong. So it really depends on each individual client, what they have got floating around their head um, that they need, you know, some help to work on. And, it, and it, it's as varied as, as, as people are varied. I offer longer term support. Um, and that's essentially to hold their hand during the process Mm -hmm. because often this is going to be, you know, it's going to be a long-term battle, quite frankly. So having someone. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I wanted to say, and I'm sorry, I wanted to circle back to the attorney decision. Mm. That's important before we move forward. Um, It is essential that you have the right attorney. It is just, I don't care what country you live in, what state you live in, it's essential that you have the right attorney. And you could have two very good attorneys who know the law, know the process, you know, and will do the best they can at representing you. But if you don't have an attorney that is schooled and understands the high conflict personality, you are going to be what we call papered to death. So these people will, as you said earlier, file and file and file and file because it's fun. And if they can afford it, it's even more fun. And yeah. so you need an attorney that will stop it. There are ways in different legal processes to stop it. You know, we have a term in California called vexatious litigant, which mm. means it's a litigant that will just file with abandon uh, to mm. cause you harm and pain. And and. Mm. They love it. So mm-hmm. there's ways in California. I, I can't do it. I'm not an attorney. Mm-hmm. But I know an attorney can file to stop it. Mm-hmm. And because you can see mm-hmm. just, you, you can see the, um, uh, the, the, the litter of mm-hmm. filings over years. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, how necessary are they? What are, what are they actually talking about? You know what? And you're tying up the court's time. So you mm-hmm attorney that not only understands the high conflict personality, understands how it's expressed um, verbally, but also Mm -hmm. understands and doesn't want to make money at responding. See, here's the game in law. Your attorney will make money on responding to your spouse who's a high conflict personality. Mm -hmm. You want an attorney that would be turned off by that. And money isn't the end goal. And that's very difficult to find. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I've been, I've been doing presentations, um, education presentations for um, lawyers and, and barristers in the UK. So to, to give them, you know, um, basically it's a free session that explains the dynamics behind this. Um, and part of it is it kind of serves a few purposes. One is that I get to tell them about my services so they can send me clients early. So they're not, you know, three years down the line and completely, you know, on their knees. The second thing is that they start to recognize these cases. And the third one is so I can find attorneys, I can find lawyers that do understand this so that when clients ask me I can say well I've got a couple of people on my books that I know have understood the dynamic here I've had you know lawyers say to me I've they've had these guys and they're like I've got heart sink every time I have to put a bill in I don't want to bill this woman because you know her, her ex is just financially trying to destroy her and I know what her money situation is and I, I don't know what to do so I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily um, a, a product of the legal system although the legal system gets a really bad reputation for it it's a it's a it's a result of these particular types of individuals having a fantastic time, lots of fun using this system. And if they happen to find an attorney who is, is of the same ilk, is which of the same do, time. Which they do. 
water then, to its own level. Then that's when you have a lot of problems. But Dr. Ann, honestly, and I again, I don't know what it's like in other countries and other states, but I do know in California there's a mechanism to stop it. Hmm. If they want to stop it, they can, they can attempt to, to do that. It, but it's difficult. I mean, I also agree it's complicated and difficult. And I do think there are wonderful attorneys, believe me. Mm. But you have to be careful. Uh, you just have to be careful because there's too many people that. I mean, I think in, you know, in terms of, you know, the Vexus litigation is in the divorce process in the UK, there's, you know, a set number of, of, of court steps that you have to go through. And it's not so necessarily that they're going to court part, I mean, which obviously costs a fortune, but it's the letters back and forward. Yeah. It's that, you know, that I've submitted my financial disclosure, but I just happen to forget a massive piece of it, you know. So then your lawyer has to respond to say, well, there's a big hole here. Oh, well, I, and then, you know, back and forward. And every letter then costs X amount of money right. for the lawyer's time. So, and bear in mind, like you say, if, if the difficult individual has a lot of money, they don't care, you know. That's right. No, I, um, I tell this story that um, I was sitting at a, I, I belong to several bar associations, hmm. paralegal and a mediator, and I was sitting at a bar association dinner a few years ago, waiting for the program to start, and they're very small tables, you're in close proximity with people, so you hmm. hear what people are saying, hmm. and there were two different lawyers, two solo practitioners speaking to one another. One lawyer said, hey, I got this great new case in today. Okay, great meaning lots of money. Hmm. Um, I got this great new case in today and I already heard from opposing counsel, uh, the, the lawyer who was talking uh, was representing the wife and the opposing counsel was representing the husband who apparently had money because opposing counsel supposedly said, get ready, we're going to paper you to death. <laughs> I was in shock. So, and then there, was, then there was no discussion. Then the two lawyers stopped talking and I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to eavesdrop and I'm sitting right here next to you. I wondered how you responded to opposing counsel. And the attorney said, well, how was I supposed to respond? I said that it's, um, it's unethical and that you won't have it. And that papering me to death means that your uh, client wants to cause my client emotional harm. And I can't let that happen if I'm going to properly represent. That's what should have been said, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I said, the reason why my level of service exists is because of what you just said. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And I see, I mean, I see, you know, I see the, 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 the impact of, of that type of behavior, you know, I, because, and we're not talking about just the women themselves, but the children, the downstream is really for the children. Because when mum is being, you know, what is essentially assaulted via the legal system on a regular basis, then it's the, you know, her mental health suffers, which then impacts on the children. Absolutely. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a societal issue it's a moral issue you know as you said it's an ethical professional issue mm -hmm. um and it, it and it is about you know this isn't about how much money you can make it, it's about the, the damage the out you know the outfall damage and you know even some of the, the lawyers who deal with these cases um they offer services for mental health support for the lawyers themselves because in some ways if you're a normal everyday sort of person who just happens to be a lawyer and you're caught in the eye of the storm with you know this this crazy other person who is um sending all of these very strange requests of your client all the time it impacts on them as well because they can't make sense of it so it becomes you know, you can have literally one very incredibly difficult personality disordered individual who's just creating utter chaos everywhere they go. And unless they're, you know, unless the education or and the um, awareness that of the existence of these individuals amongst us is increased, then we kind of just go 
round the circle again in the loop thinking you know it the professionals thinking is it me the other you know the clients thinking it's because the lawyers are trying to take all my money right. um and we go around in and you know there's been some recent cases in the uk where you know the judges have literally been saying that it's because of of, of um highly litigious uh if counsel who who just want the money and i read the case and go I, it's not that at all what you've got is you've got a narcissist having some fun yeah. in the middle of all of this all right now i want to get to the part that's going to blow people's socks off because <laughs> um when you told me your story mm. i was incredibly amazed and I would like you to share with the audience, and thank you for saying that you would be open to doing this, um, what your day of reckoning was mm. in your own personal life as you're servicing clients with your with this beautiful approach. So as I, as I said at the start of this, my, I, I was tracking um, women who were coming from, you know, adverse childhood events and were having, you know, abuse in their relationships or their past. And as I am um, working with them, I started to realize, you know, first of all, I thought it came as a bit of a sense of disquiet, that something wasn't quite right, um, that maybe I didn't feel, you know, quite comfortable in myself. And then I started to recognize, actually, I was in one of these marriages, which was characterized by coercion and control. Um, and, uh, you know, it was in, it became incredibly difficult for me to be able to be authentic in the work I did. You know, here I was telling everyone how they're supposed to live. You know, here's me, the psychologist, the you know, Lord on high. Yes, you need to do this to feel happy in your life and you shouldn't accept that sort of behavior in the home. You know, all of this. And then, of course, you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, actually, I'm describing my own marriage. So I then separated from my ex-partner, my ex-husband now, and all of the things that I teach in the Rapid Intervention Program were what I had to learn on my own over the period of, well, three and a half, four years, um, because I had to deprogram myself. I didn't have lawyers that understood what was happening. I didn't myself understand what was happening. Um, I have been to court numerous times, numerous back and forward litigation, and I had to learn how to live whilst all this was going on. I had to learn that, um, you know, if I lived the divorce in this frozen state, all that was going to happen was I was I was going to go down, essentially. So that's why I started my Freedom to Thrive, because it was actually really a declaration of self. Um, it was my message to myself. And someone asked me, why don't you call it um, your freedom to thrive? And I said, no, 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 because you have to read the words. Everyone who reads the words is talking to themselves. Um, and that's pretty much why I began this. Um, I think I told you I wanted to work with professional footballers. <laughs> that was my dream job. <laughs> that was my plan. <laughs> um, but I think the universe had other, had, had other ideas. And, um, you know, it's... It's a, it's a difficult job because sometimes, you know, I'm listening to just the sheer inhumanity and brutality that your a, a supposedly loving partner can in, inflict on, you know, their partner and their children. Um, I have to be almost unshockable at times at just the nature of the, the manipulation. And, you know, in some ways... Coming from that, it helps me because I can call out call out the rubbish when the women are saying it because I'm like, you know, being there, done it, got the T-shirt. And at the same time, I can also totally understand what it feels like and how absolutely devastating it is to be in that situation um, and to be isolated um, and confused and feeling like you are the one that's suspect. You know, I for a long time it felt like 
because everyone believes conflict is between two people, you know, that means that you're equally responsible. Um, and, you know, all I wanted to do was like the, my clients, I just wanted to get it, the divorce settled, the, the money settled and protect uh, my son, our son. I wanted it, that, that was all my, you know, goal was. Um, and I'm now four years and I still haven't got my asset settlement. So I... <laughs> are you kidding? Are you, are you divorced without the settlement terms? Yeah. Interesting. So it's, you know, so I know firsthand how bizarre the system can be. I know how, how firsthand what it can feel like when you're doing everything you possibly can to do it the right way. Yeah. And your, your ex seems to be doing everything they can the wrong way and, and isn't being held, held to account. Yeah. So yeah, my freedom to thrive was my declaration of saying, you know what, well, ultimately you have to learn to live, to grow, to thrive, to strive in spite of them in spite of the divorce. And that's what I teach the ladies I work with. How has your life and your practice grown uh, since your realization? And oh, it's, it's completely different. I mean, it's completely different. I think, I mean, you know, I think I mentioned to you before, it's really difficult as a professional to be open. We're taught we have to be objective. We have, we're taught that we have to keep everything separate, that our personal life is, is irrelevant. Um, I found that in my case, that's not true because the women I work with are so ashamed. They're so, so vulnerable that knowing that, hey, here I am sitting with my two degrees and my PhD in psychology and I got stung, I was you, you know, it, it, it can happen to anybody. It allows them to feel safe. Now, obviously, there's bits of it which isn't relevant to each and every case, you know, so it's not me saying, oh, this is my life and this is all the terrible things that happened to me. It's not relevant in that way. But I can show them, hey, look, I've been there. I got through that tunnel. It's very dark. It's very, very long, but there is light and you can get there and I'll, and I'll, I'll help you and I'll show you how to do it. And, and the quickest way possible, as opposed to, you know, I spent three years wandering around in, in, in no man's land trying to work it out. Um, so my practice is completely different. I'm, 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 I'm myself in my practice now. I'm not pretending to be anybody else. Um, you Isn't know. that wonderful when that happens? Um, I know Brene Brown did not develop the concept of vulnerability. Mm. She just brought it forward, you know, and mm. made it a discussion. But it's so wonderful, I have found, I think, when people become vulnerable mm. and really talk about things that, they didn't talk about, reveal things mm. about themselves that um, they either didn't know, <laughs> um, mm. couldn't name, couldn't define, or were keeping secret. And once that happens, you're free. You literally are free. And then mm. you can develop your authentic self. And that's, I guess, where happiness is. I, I think the thing is, it's when we try to pretend to be someone else, it costs a lot of energy. When we say, you know, here I am, I am an imperfect human being who is doing the best I can to, to get through this thing called life. I am learning every trick and I can to do it. Um, I'm, I'm putting my, you know, I, I tell my partner, my, my new partner, I says, it's like well, how I see my work is I put my piss helmet on and I've got my lamp and I go off into the dark places to help people get out of them because I know what the dark places are because I was in it. Um, and, you know, if I can help even a handful of people to find their way out, for me, it's their children, it's their grandchildren, it's all the people around them. Yeah. 
No, beautifully said, beautifully said. With that, I would like people to be able to get in touch with you. How can they do so? So I've got my website, which is www.myfreedomtothrive.com. And on that, they will they can read a bit about me. They can read some of my blog posts. Um, there's a little video of me and they've got, there's a contact. So I offer 15-minute free consultation. So if anyone wants to have a chat and then we'll see if I'm the right person. If I'm not the right person, then I'll do everything I can to find somebody who is the right person to help them. Um, as I say, I've got other people that I, I can refer to. I've also got uh, my Instagram account. Um, I think that's my Freedom to Thrive as well. And um, I've got a Facebook page, but mainly you'll find me probably on LinkedIn. So it's um, Dr. Anne on LinkedIn, and I post a lot of stuff. I have conversations there very much with lawyers and legal professionals so that I can start to cross the boundaries so that they can become more aware of these issues. And I try in, in diff, all the different social medias to, to present information that's appropriate to that audience so that I can share as much as I can to Im, improve, you know, the experience for all the people who have got the misfortune to be going through this type of situation. Well, I really appreciate that you do. I really appreciate that you shared all of this with us. You know, with the 10 years that I put into this business and the books I've read and the people I've talked to, um, I just like the way you, you've defined, approached, and, and discussed all of this. And thank you so much for giving us your professional experience and your time. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and um, continue what you're doing, Judith, because I'm sure you're helping a lot of people by giving them some good quality information. And that's what everybody needs in, when they're going through this type of a divorce, whether it's high conflict or just normal. Or just normal. I know. It's all tough. I thank all of you as well for joining us, as I do each and every week. If you would like to contact me, you may do so through my website podcast website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 